Good evening and welcome. Thank you for sharing in this celebration of worship, uh, Ash Wednesday evening. My name is Kirk Winslow. I have the privilege of being the pastor here and also tonight of sharing this stage with two of my beloved friends and colleagues and people to whom I turn often when I need some guidance in the life of faith. The Reverend Chanetta Goodjoin is here from New Hope Presbyterian Church and the Reverend Dr. Mark Davis, pastor of St. Mark Presbyterian Church. We gather tonight as a very intentional expression of unity. Though we are three congregations, we are most certainly one church in Christ. And even more importantly, we share the one mission of Christ, to love God and to love each other in the purpose of loving our larger world back to wholeness. In this year of great division, of global pandemic isolating us socially, of political strife tearing at not only our national union, but sometimes tearing even at the fabric of our Christian union as well. The growing gulf between rich and poor, the realization for many like me that racism endures in our culture, not only on the fringes of society, but in the many of our most powerful institutions. And so there is justice that needs to be brought so that healing and reconciliation can begin. And this is our work. This is the church's work to share with Jesus in the establishment of Shalom, to bring peace and wholeness and security and rest to every corner of our earth. And so we join tonight to embody in worship the truth that Jesus is our peace and in his flesh he has made all groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, the hostility that was between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create on himself one new humanity of many, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death our hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, all of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. For in him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent. The 40 days preceding Easter originally set apart to prepare new disciples for their baptismal vows. It soon became a season celebrated by all believers as a period of focused reflection and repentance. In Lent, we walk again to the cross. We see again the power of sin and its grip. We hear again the fading shouts of Hosanna and the rising demand to crucify him. We witness again the kiss of betrayal. We remember again the silver coins. We behold again friends sleeping in the garden. We catch again the echoes of denial. I do not know him. As we walk, we acknowledge that were we there, we would have done the same thing. Even now, our sins beset us, humans ever in need of healing, forgiveness, and transformation. So a traditional practice of Ash Wednesday in worship is imparting the ashes, an ancient symbol of grief and death as fingers trace the shape of the cross on our foreheads. We hear the words, from dust you were taken, and to dust you shall return. 
for the wages of sin is death. But this year, we have chosen to enter Lent with a slightly different symbol. Instead, three symbols, those of dirt, seed, and water. For while the journey of Lent is to the cross, the story does not end at Calvary. For in God's mercy and by God's power, out of death comes resurrection. As God breathed life into the dust of humanity at the moment of creation, so in the new creation, God breathes eternal life. So we invite you to join us in this physical act of planting and watering a seed as a small act of faith. We do not make the grasses grow, but we trust the one who brings life to all creation. Will you join me in the call to worship from the 44th chapter of the prophet Isaiah? I will read the portions in white and ask that you join me with the responses in yellow. To a sinful Israel, captive in Babylon as punishment for her wrongs, the Lord declares. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, from whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you in the womb and will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They shall spring up like a green tamarisk, like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will be called by the name of Jacob. Yet another will write on the hand, the Lord's, and adopt the name of Israel. Let us worship the God of our salvation. Sculptor of the mountains, God the miller of the sand, God the jeweler of the heavens, God the potter of the land, you are womb of all creation, we are formless. Shape us now, God, the unexpected infant, God, the calm, determined youth, God, the table-turning prophet, God, the resurrected truth, you are present every moment we are searching meet us now friends as we enter this portion of our worship service we're going to begin with a reading from the book of genesis in a story that's often called the second creation story and we'll conclude with one verse from the next chapter, which is often called the fall. Listen for the word of God. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, 
For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the earth. Then the Lord God formed a human from the dust of the earth and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. And the human became a living thing. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there God put the human whom God had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the middle of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then from the third chapter, after Adam and Eve had left the garden, we read these words. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. This ends the reading. Thanks be to God. So friends, in this service, we're inviting you to have some soil and some water and some seeds available so that you can be part of the interactivity of this service. So as we hear the scripture, initially, I just invite you to take some of the soil that you have. Mine is a mixture of potting soil and mulch, so it's very chunky. But I want you to smell it. And I want you to get your fingernails dirty. And I want you to enjoy the, taste, the touch of it. The smell and the touch of the earth, the ground, the dust, out of which we were created and into which we will return. When we get our hands on the dust, the dirt, it reminds us of our finitude it reminds us of our mortality. But as you heard the end of our scripture reading today, the phrase, from dust you have come to dust you shall return, also reminds us of our brokenness, of our sinfulness, of our activity and our part in the world being out of sync with its original created purpose. So as part of our service this evening, we are going to offer a song that's called a Kyrie. Kyrie would be the, um, the part of the Latin phrase for Lord have mercy. And we're asking the Lord to have mercy on us. So I invite you to center yourself and assume a, a, a posture and a disposition of prayer as through music and words, we offer this prayer for God's mercy. Stardust of created multiverses, 
to the dirt under our fingernails. The substance of your creative power never ceases to amaze us. From dirt, you have created a world filled with diversity, a kaleidoscope of beauty for us to enjoy and celebrate. Instead, we have made diversity into difference, community into competition. God have mercy. Loving God, in Christ you came to live among us, bearing our frailties and sharing our pain. In Christ you met hate with love and insults with blessing. In Christ you showed us how to live with purpose and to die with hope. But it was human hands that put our Christ to death. Human will that rejected your love, your gift of love. God have mercy. Merciful God, despite our sins, our warring madness, the violence in our streets, our homes, and our hearts, you gave us the promise of new life. In this moment of silence, may our hearts be filled with awe and wonder at your grace. With confidence in your love, we ask again for mercy. Thank you. 
Friends, hear this good news. When we humble ourselves before the loving God, God meets us with grace. God knows your frame and knows that you were created out of the dust of the earth. God knows our weakness and God hears our prayer. And with grace and mercy, God answers our prayer and brings us peace. Thanks be to God. So now I invite you to take your dirt, take your soil, take what you have, and put it in the pot. This will be the beginning of our activity together for this Ash Wednesday. From ashes to ashes, from dust to dust. Out of the dust you have come, into the dust you shall return.
our first gospel reading for tonight, recounts events that took place the day after Palm Sunday, uh, the day after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Crowds from all over uh, the Roman world had traveled to Jerusalem as well to celebrate the Passover and were jubilant at the possibility that surrounded Jesus' arrival. In their minds, this might well have been the moment when God's Messiah would finally be revealed and the oppressive powers of both Herod and Caesar vanquished. They presumed that salvation might be mere days away, and in a sense, they were right. But Jesus had entered the city riding a donkey, not a war horse, and He had done so for a reason. Jesus understood that God's victory is not won by violence done, but by violence received. And that while the crowds were electric with anticipation of God's glorious victory coming in battle against Rome and her vassals, Jesus was preparing Himself for a very different understanding of glory. Our reading is from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 to 26, from the New Revised Standard Version. John writes, Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Mark has just passed to us the soil, and all that soil signifies in Scripture, from life in the garden to the depths of the grave, and now it is our turn to turn to seed an image that Jesus Himself calls upon to explain how salvation works in His personal donation of His life and in the whole project of restoration. Jesus, who Himself both inaugurates and is the very kingdom of God, paints a picture of glory that centers not on the symbols of earthly might, of sword and spear, not on the symbols of wealth and luxury. There are no gold or jewels in Jesus' story. Jesus seeks to paint a picture of glory using a single grain of wheat. And unless a grain falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Of all the offerings that could be made by an ancient Hebrew in the temple, the least and the lowliest was the small grain offering. And yet within those very grains being brought as a sacrifice to the Lord is found the central truth of the whole Christian faith, that sin and death never have the last word. It occurred to me as I was meditating on this text, uh, as one who is very much not a gardener, that to plant a seed is really quite an act of faith. And we take a thing that has value, and often the value seems relatively small, but symbolically it's, a, it's an object of value that could be used for something else, and we bury it. We put it literally out of our sight, and we can do our best to put it in good soil and to water and find the right sunlight, but ultimately we, we take a treasure and we place it in the earth. And we know in doing so that we have no power to bring life out of that act in and of itself. Rather, we must trust that the, the life is present within 
the husk within the shell. And trusting in that truth, we go on about our work. Right? Long before we see a sprout, we water, we till, we fertilize again and again, often looking at only what appears on the surface to be empty soil. Indeed, if I try to dig up the seed to check on it, to see if the process is working, I may well undo the very life I seek to bring. Rather, I must simply stay at work, often unimpressive and dirty and sometimes tiresome work, and believe that the working matters and that God will bring life. Not because I have any power to accomplish the life bringing itself, but because I can collaborate with God in His project of new creation, right? It is God who brings the life, but my labor, my effort, my attention, my toil matters. And so it is with the salvation of the world and all that the world contains. The bringing of justice, establishing peace, offering security, granting rest. I cannot create any of those, nor can I force them to sprout out from the conditions of this earth. But I can labor diligently, tending the soil, offering the water, and trust that new creation is emerging out of my sight. New roots of life and hope and peace and mercy and justice are being established, and one day their fruit will be undeniable. But most of my work is to tend to the seed, and I can tend to mine, and you can tend to yours, and others can tend to theirs, and so on and so forth. And in that way, the redemptive power of Christ is multiplied until suddenly the blessings of the kingdom are everywhere. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grade. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Let us be people who labor in faith, trusting that God who has brought life out of death will do so until that day He reigns forever. If you have your soil and seed with you as I do, I would invite you to take your pot, take your seed, plant with me as we pray. Gracious God, Lord of love and life, we remember the humility of Jesus who walked the road of mercy and compassion, even as crowds would soon seek His death, returning neither harm for harm nor injustice for injustice. He offered Himself to death, laying His body in the soil and trusting Your power to bring life eternal. As we return these small seeds to the earth from which they come, Grant us the faith to labor in hope. May we not only till the literal soil of the ground, but stir all the foundations of our broken world. May our sweat, our tears, our prayers, our marches, our songs, our worship, our art, even our blood, contribute to the growth of new creation. If it is given to us to see the fruit of our labors, then we give you thanks. And if it is not, let us never waver, even for a moment, from our duties and from our confidence that the way to life is love, whatever the cost. Forgive us our selfish conceits, our willful ignorances, our sloth in the face of injustice and oppression, and refresh us with your spirit to labor alongside each other in Christ's name until he comes again. Amen.
chapter 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the, work, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Water. Water is the essential element of life. We can't live without water. In Genesis, the first chapter, we see that water was created on the first day. The earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. What is water? Water is purity and hope. Water is salvation and healing. Water is spirit and truth. And we must stir the water and pour the water upon the earth and the seed as we enter the journey of death that leads us to redemption and reconciliation and resurrection. As we stir the water, as we pour the water, as we touch the water, we also wade in its freedom. We remember the tears of the slave, the trials of life. We will not forget the middle passage and the waters that receive those who could not endure the hardship of the bondage. We honor the courage of those who trusted God to trouble the waters and to part the Red, Red Sea. And as we stir and touch the waters, as we pour them upon the earth and the sea, we remember that our God proclaimed release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free. As we stir these waters and touch these waters and pour these waters upon dirt and seed, we remember that the seed of salvation was planted in a sin-sick world and watered by the Holy Spirit so that we could embrace the living water that faced rejection, discrimination, and death. As we stir the waters and pour the water upon the earth and seed, what we do is embrace the love of God. We walk in the wisdom of the ancestors. We stand in faith and unity. We die and live together. Again and again, we let the waters flow upon the earth, upon the seed, upon the promise and the love of God. Let the water bring us life. The dirt tells the story of creation, how we strain against pain to live the refrain again and again. Of justice slain, what remains is absorbed into the earth again and again. We dig into the pit of remorse, the rotted decay of unfavorable discourse, of words left untended, thoughts that need to be mended, again and again. We turn the dirt, uncover the bare bones of questions unanswered, again and again. We remove the shards of inequity buried with our silence, Again and again, we unearth the ashes of insurrection. The dust of diminished hope settles on our hands, in our lungs. We can't breathe. Again and again. We exhume what remains of history unclaimed. We toss the hard pebbles, remove the grit. The soil converts the spoils of humanity into minerals of hope that nurture the seed of a new promise. Again and again, the seed tells the story of creation, how we strain against the pain to live the refrain of life unretained and contained within the will to plant change. Again and again, we must wrap the tender shoots of fragile roots with the rich black soil 
of a new truth and freedom. Again and again, the seed bears witness to acceptance and equality, beauty for ashes, and prophetic truth that reconciles the darkness of history's unspoken sorrow and the promise of our new tomorrow. Its strength is in its weakness and its potential is in our hands. With courage to thrive, the seed of life abides in the water of God's redemptive plan. Again and again, the water tells the story of creation. How we strain against the pain to live the refrain of faith dependent upon the rain to replenish the earth and define our worth to clear the dearth of love unbirthed again and again. Let the water feed the soil again and again. Let the water find the seed again and again. Let the streams of redemption flow through the call of God to replenish our souls and set the captives free again and again. Let the waters of justice nourish the soil of redemption. Again and again, let the waters of righteousness nourish the seeds of reconciliation. So that new life can burst forth. So that new unity can take root. So that a new peace can spring forth. 